All right, I'm all connected. And if you would, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. My lesson sermon today actually piggybacks uh, on top of what uh, Mark was teaching on this morning and going through the gospel and how man at his best state is altogether vanity and no matter how good a person thinks he is with all his good works and all his righteousness, he's still a worm in the sight of the Lord based on that passage there in Job. So that dealt with the man and salvation. My lesson today is going to deal with the Christian and salvation and, and the Christian and uh, his walk with Christ. So let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Just got to get my bearings here. And let's open in a word of prayer. Father, I come before you this morning, and I thank you, God, for giving us this place to meet. Thank you, God, for giving us the Bible. Thank you for giving us the truth and the scriptures. And I do pray, Father, that you'd help me to get these points across this morning. And God, this is such a simple concept, but like salvation, it's so easy to overlook and to complicate. Uh, sometimes, God, the world complicates your simple salvation. And uh, I pray that you'd help me to get the point of this sermon across this morning. And I pray, God, you speak to the, your people and, and feed them this morning. And I trust you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So let's, uh, let's, let's see. The title of my sermon today is How Christ Can Profit You Nothing. Now, Admittedly, that sounds like a title like that might be borderline sacrilege and maybe even downright blasphemous. But the Bible says, for the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth meat there in Job 34, 3. And that title really should taste funny, you know, to your ears. Christ profit me nothing. What? You mean God's holy, perfect, sinless son, my savior, can be of no benefit to me? You're saying that he can profit me nothing and his sacrifice on Calvary be completely worthless? Is that what you're saying? And that should be an abomination to your ears. It doesn't sound right at all. Like you should be thinking, how can you say that? What are you talking about? But that's what I said, and that's what I meant, because I'm simply referring to a statement made by the greatest Christian who ever lived, who, bas who said the same thing, and he said what he said and meant what he meant. And look at this incredible statement here in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and look at verse 1. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Nothing. Okay? Now you're thinking, oh, surely he can't mean that. Oh, surely he must be exaggerating. But he actually isn't. And in case you think Paul might be mistaken here, allow me to remind you that this is given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, I'm not the only one saying this. And Paul's not the only one saying this. The Holy Spirit is saying here in this passage to a bunch of believers, to a bunch of Christians, that it is possible that Christ can profit you nothing in your life. So I want to explain and preach about this morning this concept of Jesus Christ profiting nothing and how that can actually very easily come about in your Christian life. Now, what I'm explaining here or what Paul is explaining here uh, to the Galatians is truthfully one of the most important concepts in the entire New Testament for you as a Christian to understand. And this has to do with your legal standing with Jesus Christ and your active daily belief in that legal standing. Remember, the Bible says that God is a judge. He is a judge of all the earth. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And so remember that I've told you multiple times, if you look at the New Testament, if you look at salvation and your walk with Christ from the standpoint of legal technicalities, salvation, the gospel, your walk with Jesus Christ will make a whole lot more sense. If you think about it from a legal standpoint, the theme of the book of Galatians is that the Christian is justified by faith. OK, justified is linked to the words just, you know, like a just judgment or justice. That's where we get that word. All right. To be justified means that you've been made just. You're innocent. You're blameless. 
You're without guilt. The scales of judgment have been made equal. They've been made proper. You're justified, okay? So let's say someone was suing you and you were drawn into court. If the judge slams the gavel down and says, not guilty, in other words, what he has said is, you are justified. That's the same thing. Not guilty. You're justified. You're made just, okay? And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you chose him as your savior, God slammed the gavel down and he said, not guilty. Matt Crane is justified. When I trusted Christ as my savior and same for you. You are not justified because your good works outweighed your bad. Nor were you justified because the judge just loved you so much. That's not what justified you. Love is nice. Love is great. Praise God for it. But it is blood that pays sin's bills. It's blood. And fortunately, God's love is not simply affection or emotion. God's love was manifest in an action, and he sent his son to die for you on the cross. If God had just said, I love you so much, but then never sent his son, you'd still die and go to hell. Because love didn't save you. The blood of Christ is what justifies you. And it was the love of God that sent his son to pay that payment. All of those parts are important. All of those parts are necessary. Jesus wouldn't have come and died on the cross if God didn't love, right? If God didn't so love the world, right? So those things all go together. And, and uh, your justification is based upon a payment that had to be made and was made on your behalf. You can be declared not guilty because Jesus allowed himself to be declared guilty on your behalf right? He took your guilty sentence so that you could take his not guilty sentence. He took your death so that you could have his life. He took your sin so that you could have his righteousness. You understand? Before you met Jesus, you were declared guilty by the law that you were under. You might have thought that you were a good person. But the question is, what standard of good were you going by, right? You, what you consider to be good or what God considers to be good. You see, a lot of people out there, you talk to them about Jesus Christ and say, oh, well, I'm a good person. Well, whose standard of goodness are you going by? Your standard or God's standard? Yes, by your standard, indeed, you probably were a good person. You know, no doubt. Because by your standards, as long as you didn't kill anybody, you were a good person. <laughs> you know, a real high standard there. Uh, or maybe your standard was a little bit higher, you know, and you gave to charity and you helped out in your community and you treated others with respect. And so, therefore, you were a good person, right? Yes, by your own standards, you were a good person. But as anyone with a brain knows, in court, you aren't judged by your standards. You're judged according to the laws that are written on the books, right? You know, a thief could stand before a judge and and say, well, I'm not as bad as Adolf Hitler. And by his own standard, he's a good person. But he's not judged according to his standard. He's judged according to the laws on the books. You want to know what God's standard is? God's standard is James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. It's all or nothing with God. You see, eternal life in, in heaven, and the salvation of your soul, right, is a high-valued prize. The Bible says, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Your soul is more important than this entire stinking earth and everything on it. That's how valuable your soul is. And salvation of your soul for eternity is a very high value, valued prize and is not something that can be earned by simply not killing anybody. <laughs> okay? The thing is, such a high reward has to be matched by an equally high requirement. That makes sense. And that requirement is sinless perfection. That's all. You know, and hey, God gave us ten commandments. Just ten. Ten commandments. You can count them all on your fingers. And just to make it easy, one of those was a Jewish ceremonial commandment. So you don't even have to worry about it. That's not a moral law. So he gave you nine. He made it easy on you. Just keep nine commandments for your whole life and you're all set. But the problem is you can't even keep those commandments. Why? Because you've been damaged from birth thanks to your sin nature passed down from Adam, and therefore it's impossible for anybody to meet those nine requirements. Nobody can. Yeah, sure, some might get higher than others, but if you commit one sin, one sin, you get disqualified from salvation and eternal life. 
and you are just as disqualified as the murderer or as the guy that broke all nine. Disqualification is disqualification. God's law told you how you're supposed to live, and you failed miserably. At innumerable times in your life, you chose to sin, you chose disobedience, and thus you were bound by sin, and you broke the law. You broke God's law. And it's not that the law was bad, right? The law was not looking for an excuse to bind you. Think of a police officer, right? Uh, the law is like a police officer. If you don't break the law... The police officer won't bother you. The problem is, you have a lead foot and a need for speed, <laughs> you know, by nature. So naturally, you choose to speed and the policeman pulls you over. That's how it works. It's not the, it's not the policeman's fault for pulling you over, right? It's your fault. He's just doing his job. Okay, so you break the law. The law puts handcuffs on you and now you're bound. Now question. Were you bound by sin or were you bound by the law? Technically, the answer is both. The answer is both. The law puts you in bondage, but so did your sin because those two things work together. And it's not that the law is bad. It's that, sin, like, like Paul said in Romans, sin by the law took advantage of the law and by it slew me, right? And that's the case that Paul is trying to make both in the book of Romans and in the book of Galatians. It's not that the law is bad. It's that you are bad. And the solution is not decriminalization. The solution is not decriminalize arson. The solution is quit burning things down. <laughs> the solution is not defund the police. The solution is quit breaking the law. And the police won't bother you. <laughs> All right? Now, the law is not bad. You are bad. Okay? Now, here's the thing. The law is a bit of a stickler, as you might say. And you don't possess the ability to adhere to the law's requirements. And thus, no matter how hard you try, you will always fail. And the law will always declare your, you guilty. And spiritually, you will always be in handcuffs. Now, like I said, when Jesus Christ finally comes into the picture... He removes the handcuffs when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and ask for Him to be your Savior, you know. Uh, he removes the handcuffs and He gives you liberty, okay? You're justified. When you get saved, you're justified, you're forgiven, and you're free. All you need to do as a Christian now, now for, many, for maybe some of you, it was just a few years ago that you met Jesus Christ and, and were born again. Maybe for some of you, it's been decades. You've been saved for many, many, many years, Okay, but think back to that time when you trusted Jesus Christ. At that moment, you were justified. You were forgiven. The blood washed you white as snow, right? You were declared not guilty. Now, all you need to do is stay there. Don't move from that position of liberty and freedom in Jesus Christ. Okay? You need to rest there by faith. And your life is to be lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, relying upon God's grace and simply having faith and trusting in God for all things and in all things. We're to walk in the Spirit on the straight and narrow path. And so really the Christian life is not that complicated. It's really not. It's no more complicated than salvation is, really. When you get right down to it and you read Romans and you read Galatians, you realize the, salvation, the Christian life is just... Grace and faith. Grace and faith. Grace and faith. Grace and faith. Based on what Jesus did and who He is. Okay? And that's what salvation is. Grace and faith. The problem comes in when we begin to complicate it. Okay? When we try to overcomplicate things. You say, well, surely the Christian life can't be that easy. Well, I just believe you got to earn it. Well, I believe, I, I know you have to believe, but you got you to work too. Isn't that how unsaved people think, right? That's the natural thinking of the flesh. That's the carnal mind. That's natural fleshly thinking, okay? You know what? You as a Christian are still capable of thinking carnally, right? You can still think those, the, the old ways. Before you got saved, you had some certain mentalities, maybe about salvation. Well, you know, I got to earn it. But after you get saved, and you realize, oh, no, I don't have to earn it for salvation. I just need to trust Christ as my Savior. It's a free gift. And you get saved. But after you get saved, like the Galatians, you can go back to a mentality where you're thinking, well, now that I'm saved, now I have to earn it. Earn, earn, God's, earn merit with God. Earn God's favor and all those things. You've got to watch out for that. So many Christians' attitude towards the Christian life is, 
well, surely the victorious Christian life can't be that easy. Well, I just believe you got to earn it. Well, yes, you have to believe, but you have to work, too. Uh, is that so? Well, that's what the Galatians were thinking. That was the Galatians' mindset. They had trusted Christ as their Savior. Paul is writing to saved people, and you see that throughout the book. Okay, Keep that in mind. But someone, after Paul had left Galatia, someone had come into town and started telling them, the Christian life can't be that easy. You have to believe, yes, but you have to work. And you have to earn it too. And the particular work that was being promoted in those days was the work of circumcision. All right? He says, oh, yes, you got saved. That's great. I certainly believe in salvation and all that. That's wonderful. And uh, I believe in salvation by grace through faith, yes. But now that you're saved, in order to be more right with God, in order to be more righteous with God, in order to be more justified with God, you need to get circumcised. That was the message that was being promoted in Galatia. Now remember, what is circumcision? Circumcision was a, one of the ordinances of the law. Circumcision was a ceremonial commandment. It was a tradition, right, of the Jews in the Old Testament. Circumcision was not a moral issue like the nine of the Ten Commandments. It may have been a moral issue for those Jewish people, and certainly they needed to follow through with that or else God would punish them. Okay? But the thing is, if circumcision was a universally moral issue, okay, then that would mean that it would still be required to this day. That would mean it would have been always required for both Jew and Gentile, right? It would have been required before the flood or before the law, during the law, and after the law. If it was a universally moral issue, okay? And failure to do so would be a sin against God. But that wasn't the case for the Gentiles, obviously. All right, so bear in mind, you got to see the difference that circumcision has to do with the ordinances and the traditions. And it's different from thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. Those things were true before the law was written. They were true during the law, and they're true after the law. Even after you get saved in Christ, if you steal, that's a sin. <laughs> it's always been a sin. Why? Because it goes against the very nature of God himself. Circumcision is in a different category, okay? Now, uh, circumcision was not a moral issue in that respect, but this local Galatian Bible teacher was telling people, oh, yes, it is a moral issue, and you have to do it as a Christian. Basically, he was turning a religious tradition that applied to the Jewish people. Think about this. He was turning a religious tradition into a moral issue and saying, if you didn't get circumcised, you're a bad person or you're a lesser Christian. He was turning a cultural habit, okay, that, yes, was an Old Testament thing for Jewish people. But Jesus Christ, remember when he died on the cross, it says he... Uh, he, uh, what is it say in Colossians? He uh, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, all that stuff. He took it out of the way, the, the ordinances of the law. Okay, He fulfilled that stuff. It wasn't necessary after that. They were turning a cultural habit into a moral issue. And the idea was, if you didn't get circumcised back in Galatia, you were displeasing to God. You know, you were disobeying the Bible. You know, you were backslidden. You were out of the will of God if you didn't do that. Uh, you were not right with God, and you were not righteous with God. And in order to be really saved, in order to be really justified, you had to get circumcised. And if you get circumcised, you'll be fine. It's just a little thing. Just a little cut in the skin, that's all. And if you really loved God, you would do it. <laughs> right? Ah, uh, yes. Such a little insignificant thing, right? Strengthened by a guilt trip. Strengthened by peer pressure. Strengthened by intimidation. Is it just me, or does that not sound like the Holy Spirit? That sounds more like a cult to me. <laughs> oh yeah, you have liberty to get circumcised, but if you don't, we'll disown you, we'll disfellowship with you, we'll distance from you, and we'll diss you behind your back. But don't worry, you have liberty. <laughs> don't worry, kind of like the Jews in Auschwitz. You know, yeah, you have liberty to escape Auschwitz, you have liberty. You can climb the fence or go over the fence, but we'll shoot you in the back if you do. But you have liberty. You have liberty. <laughs> That's the kind of liberty that the world gives. 
That's, that's a double speak is what that is. But that was the religious environment that was starting to form in Galatia. It didn't start that way. When Paul came to town and preached Christ and him crucified, he didn't say, and you guys need to get circumcised. He didn't say that to the Jew, and he didn't say that to the Gentile. It's not necessary for any form of justification or righteousness with God. God literally could care less. As far as your standing, your legal standing with God, circumcision has nothing to do with anything. Okay? But that's what this false teacher was starting to teach in Galatia. It's funny, there's a play on words there. They're talking about circumcision and cutting and cutting off. And Paul says, I wish uh, that guy was cut off that troubles you. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on there. It's a sarcasm thing. And uh, don't read too much into that. But it's interesting that he, put, that he puts that in there, there in uh, uh, verse 12. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. All right. Now, like I said, it didn't start this way. But thanks to some false teaching... And thanks to some extra religious requirements being sprinkled in, it was starting to turn into this. It was becoming a hybrid Christianity. It was like it was God's message plus man's message. Trying to get the two together, you know. Uh, it, was, it wasn't that anything was necessarily wrong with circumcision. There's nothing wrong with it. But they were just trying to add it to not only the gospel, but trying to add it to the Christian life, Okay. It was a hybrid Christianity that says circumcision was not necessary to be saved. Oh, no, we don't teach that. But, it, but you do need it after, after you get saved in order to be right with God. You know, and uh, Christians fall for this kind of thing all the time. Allow me to rephrase it in maybe some different terms so that to help you to see the absurdity of this kind of thinking. Circumcision is not necessary to be justified with God. But you do need it after you get saved in order to be more justified with God. You see, that, think of that statement from a legal standpoint. There's no such thing as more justified. There's no such thing as that. You're either justified or you're not. It'd be like saying it this way. Circumcision is not necessary to be declared not guilty by God. But you do need it after you get saved in order to be more not guilty with God. You see how stupid that sounds? That's absurd. You can't, it's impossible to be more not guilty. It's impossible to be more justified. It's impossible to, to, be, to add more righteousness to Christ's righteousness. Do you understand? That's impossible. But that is exactly the kind of false doctrine that was creeping into Galatia. And at that time, it was coming under the disguise of circumcision. Circumcision, just a little thing. Exactly. It's just a little thing. But it was in this context, talking about circumcision, where Paul says what he says in verse 9. Look at it. Verse 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Circumcision is just a little thing. Just attempting to add a little bit of righteousness to Christ's righteousness messes up the whole thing. If a lost person, think about this. Now, this is what you need to understand. Now, there's a difference between the gospel, okay, and the Christian life, all right, and walking in the Spirit. There's a difference between uh, living in the Spirit, which happens when you get saved. You're put into the Spirit. You're put into Christ, okay? And then there's the daily walking in the Spirit, okay? You can say that there's state and standing, you know, and all that, position and practice, all that. Okay, let's take a look at it from the standpoint of the gospel real quick and this concept of adding to Christ. This is easy to understand from the standpoint of the gospel, but I'm going to try to show you that it's the same thing when it comes to the Christian life. Okay, if a lost person added just that little bit of leaven to salvation, and thought that in order to be saved, he had to trust Christ and be circumcised, right? In order to be saved. That teeny bit of leaven, that teeny little bit of false teaching would leaven the entire gospel for him, right? And that man would not be saved so long as he clung to the belief that circumcision gained him merit with God. If he had a gospel track and came and uh, was reading a gospel track, let's say, and it said, you need to believe on Christ at the end of it, and said, I need to believe on Christ and be circumcised in order to be saved. Okay, and if he's trusting in, oh, well, I'm going to go do that, and he schedules an appointment, and he does that, and then he believes on Christ, okay, now I'm saved. Is that man saved? No. Why? You know, he believes in Jesus, right? Well, the fact of the matter is, Christ profits that man nothing. 
the man that's trusting a work for salvation, he is not 90% saved. There's a lot of Catholics right down the road that believe in Jesus. They believe in the deity of Jesus. They believe that Jesus is God. But they're also trusting in their infant baptism. Or they're trusting in their mass. Okay? They are not 75% saved. They're not 75% not guilty. Right? It doesn't work that way. They're not 50% saved. They're not 10% saved. They're not 1% saved. That leaven that's been added to the gospel makes them 0% saved and 100% lost. Christ, even though they believe in Christ, and Jesus is God, right? They believe in Jesus, but Jesus Christ profits them nothing. Why? Because of that little leaven that's been added to Jesus Christ, right? All it takes for a man to die and go to hell for all eternity is the belief that uh, salvation is obtained by faith in Jesus Christ plus attending the Mass. Or that salvation is, is obtained by faith in Jesus Christ plus baptism. That's all it takes. Oh, it's just a little dunk in the water. A little leaven leaven that whole lump. Oh, it's just a little dunk. It's just a little wafer. Yeah, it leavened everything for you. It leavened the entire gospel. Anything in a man's mind that adds to Christ's righteousness is the kiss of death for that man. That's what it is. And it can be anything. It can be good works. It can be church membership. It can be baptism, giving to charity, helping in, the, helping in the community. All those are good things. And no one's saying that you shouldn't do some of those good things. You shouldn't take the mass. you definitely not. But uh, the, uh, all these things are good things, you know. But... Uh, your faith in Christ plus any of them for salvation would put you in hell forever. And some people don't need to repent of their wicked deeds as much as they need to repent of their righteous deeds. I'm not saying that people don't need to repent of sin, but think about that. There are some very decent, moral, clean living people out there who need to repent of their righteousness in order to be saved. Because that's what they're clinging to. They need to say, God, I am sorry for trusting in any of my good works. I repent and I choose to trust Jesus Christ's righteousness alone. They need to get that leaven out. And when it comes to salvation, God has it set up where it's all or nothing. It's all Jesus or nothing. Not Jesus plus a little bit of you. All or nothing. Now, as Christians, we understand that concept clearly when it comes to salvation. We would all say amen to that. But what many Christians fail to realize is that the same concept applies when it comes to walking in the Spirit in your daily Christian life. You see, that walking in the Spirit in the daily Christian life is no different than the Gospel. It's very, it's, it's a lot, it's very simple that way. In order to have that resurrection power, when it comes to walking in the Spirit, you have to understand that it is all or nothing. All of, your, all of your daily merit before God okay, rests in Jesus Christ's righteousness. Get that. It's all Jesus Christ's righteousness or nothing. That is your daily merit before God. That is your merit before God when you woke up this morning, when you put your Keurig in the Keurig and poured yourself a coffee. Your merit with God was based on Jesus Christ, not whether you got up and read your Bible this morning. That is not what your merit is based off of. Okay? Your merit, as soon as you walk out the doors of this church this morning, you are not more right with God because you came to church. That is not what your merit is based on. Your merit, whether you come to church every day or whether you never come to church for the rest of your life, your merit is based on Jesus Christ's righteousness. That's it. All right? For example, if a saved person okay, adds a little bit of leaven to his Christian life, and thought that in order to be, well, more right with God, he had to get circumcised, that would short-circuit his walk with God. Because walking in the Spirit is also by grace through faith. That's the key to walking in the Spirit. And if you, add, if you try to add any form of uh, required righteousness to that walk, it will cancel that walk, and you will be walking in the flesh and not the Spirit. Now listen... I'm not saying that you would lose your salvation. I'm not saying that if some Christian thinks that I need to be circumcised in order to be more right with God and then goes and gets circumcised, he's just committed some unpardonable sin because you can't really undo that. <laughs> okay? I'm not saying that. 
I'm not saying he loses salvation. I'm saying that as long as he's thinking that, as long as that is his mentality, he has no resurrection power of the Holy Spirit in his life. And that would mean that he would have no power to bear fruit unto God. Because he's trusting in Christ plus something that I'm doing in order to merit God's favor. Okay? He would have no power to bear fruit unto God because that's by the Spirit. Right? He would have no power to have victory over sin. Because that's by the Spirit. He would have no power to be pleasing to God because you would be walking in the flesh and flesh, no matter how good it appears, cannot please God. In other words, Christ would profit you nothing when it came to your daily Christian life. Now look at this guy right here. There's two guys. They look very same. And as a matter of fact, this is the same man. Except the difference is he can walk in the flesh or he can walk in the Spirit. Now this man is saved. He's born again, and no matter how, if he, and it doesn't matter what he does in his life, I, the Bible says that, uh, you know, the Bible teaches once saved, always saved. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Now, that doesn't give you a license to sin, okay? Uh, Mark taught on that this morning. You know, we're, we don't have a, uh, we're not given liberty to sin, okay? But, that you got a Christian, he can walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit on a daily basis. You make the choice. And it has to do with faith and grace. You don't walk in the spirit by being an extra good person. You don't get to walk in the spirit by being circumcised. You don't get to walk in the spirit by handing out tracts and doing all those things. Those are all good things. But that's not how you walk in the spirit. Walking in the spirit has to do with God's grace and faith. It has to do with faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, specifically the resurrection, the fact that I am dead to sin, I'm alive unto God. All right? Now listen, this guy, he's dressed up nice. Okay? He's holding a Bible, you know, on both of them. He, he looks like a really nice guy. But over here, you know what you have? This isn't like 10% uh, righteous or 90% righteous. It's all or nothing. Over here, this guy that's trusting in his circumcision or in his good works, whatever you want to say, I, I, am, I am more right with God because I went out street preaching. I, I'm more out right with God because I passed out tracts the other day. I'm more right with God because I've been faithful in church for the last 10 years. If he's trusting in that to, for his merit with God, that is a little bit of leaven that has short-circuited his walk with God. All right? And, he, and uh, as Paul puts it, he has uh, fallen from grace. Now think about that. Think about that for a second. Jesus Christ will profit. This is, this is the guy. This is the guy in Galatians chapter 5. Okay? He's, Paul says to this man, this Galatian, yeah, you guys are doing a lot of good things. You're living clean lives, trying to preach the gospel, all this stuff. But if you're trusting in your circumcision, if you're adding circumcision, you're saved, but now you're adding circumcision as a requirement for righteousness, Christ shall profit you nothing. Christ is over here. As you walk in the Spirit, Christ will profit this man nothing. The Holy Spirit of Christ will profit this man nothing. Why? Because he's quenched the Spirit. You see, we always think of quenching the Spirit in terms of doing drugs or doing something really bad. No, you can quench the Spirit by relying on your good works to gain you merit with God. That will quench the Spirit. It will short-circuit the Holy Spirit's power in your life. Adding just one little work of your own... For the purpose of meriting righteousness with God is like sticking a piece of wood between two electric wires. If you know anything about electricity, so long as the wires are attached, right, the power flows naturally. The power just goes through, no problem. But when you try to make the light brighter, okay, I want to be a better Christian. And, you know, my light is shining, you know, you got the wires connected, and I'm going to add my own righteousness and make the light bulb even brighter. What ends up happening? You end up short-circuiting the, the connection, and the light bulb goes out. That is the Christian life. Jesus Christ is the light, and He shines through you. You cannot add to that light. It's either on or it's off. <laughs> it's either on or it's off. A little leaven can leaven the whole lump. Your invented religious requirements that you think gain you merit with God, in fact, quench the flame of the Holy Spirit. And you end up walking in the darkness of your flesh, right? You end up walking in the darkness of your flesh, illuminated by the pathetic, artificial light of your own required righteousness. And it doesn't take a lot. It just takes a little bit of leaven. 
And for these Galatians, the idea that circumcision made you extra spiritual was all that it took for them to fall from grace, as he says in verse 4. Look at it. Christ has become, he says it a second time, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Ye are fallen from grace. Now, again, we've gone over this passage in the past. I won't di deep dive into it, but falling from grace doesn't have to do with losing your salvation, okay? That's not what falling from grace means. This chapter is written to saved, born-again Christians who did trust God's grace for salvation, but now that they're saved, they've fallen from grace. They've gone into the trap of thinking that they now need to do something, okay? Or they need to continually be doing something in order to maintain their level of righteousness with God. They've fallen away from grace in the fact that they're focusing back on what's the opposite of grace, works. A saved, born-again Christian can get his mind back on works. He fell away from what saved him, God's grace, and relying on that. And he can get back to the mentality and the mindset of, I need to perform. Performance, performance, performance. All right, now... Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law. Now listen, circumcision is not really a thing anymore these days with any real religious significance attached to it in Bible-believing churches in the 21st century. At least I personally can't recall the last time I've gone to church and there was a sermon on circumcision and you need to be circumcised. We're having an altar call and you're going to sign you up. I don't think I've ever been in a church like that. Uh, maybe they're out there. I don't know. Maybe you've been to a church like that. This is not one of those churches. Okay. But uh, think about that statement. Just think about that statement. You have to do some external thing, some work in order to be spiritual. In order to walk in the spirit, you have to do this thing. You do a thing to walk in the spirit. In other words, it'd be like saying this. You have to do good works in order to walk in the Spirit. That's a lie. That's not how it works. I haven't heard any sermons on the need for circumcision to be spiritual, but I can recall a lot of sermons where some other work was inserted instead of circumcision. Pick your, pick your work. How about this? In order to be spiritual, you need to be in church every time the doors are open. In other words, in order to walk in the Spirit, you need to attend church. You need to have a perfect church attendance in order to walk in the Spirit. Now question, is that how you walk in the Spirit? Is church attendance what Paul was laboriously explaining in Romans chapter 6? I don't recall reading that in there. Church attendance is a thing. It's a work that people can do. But saying that in order to be spiritual, you need to be in church is literally saying, in order to walk in the Spirit, you need to do works. And depending on whatever pastor is preaching, he decides how many works you need to do in order to walk in the Spirit. Some uh, religious fundamentalist Baptist churches might have a longer list than some other churches, you know. But uh, everybody seems to have this list. As long as you go by our list, that equals walking in the Spirit. And if you don't do our list, then you're not walking in the Spirit. And God is angry with you. And He's going to slash your tires and make you lose money. <laughs> you know, tithing is one of those. If, you, you have to, if you're not walking in the Spirit, if you're not tithing, you know, and if you don't tithe, God is going to get that money from you somehow. I, mean, I don't know if you've heard that kind of stuff, but it's like, where is that in the Bible? In the New Testament, anyway. Where are you going to find that? All right. Paul said... For in Jesus Christ, verse 6, cir neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now listen, he said circumcision neither availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. It doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not circumcised, it makes no difference. It doesn't avail anything. Now let's think about that though. Circumcision does avail some things. I mean, you could argue from a medical standpoint, physically speaking, uh, as far as hygiene is concerned, eh, it's not bad. It, it can avail some things. It's not bad. But it avails nothing. I don't try to be gross or anything, okay? But it avails nothing as far as your standing with God is concerned. 
He says it doesn't matter if you are or you aren't, it avails nothing when it comes to God. And that's the point you need to get. Your standing with God is based solely on Jesus Christ and His merit. That's it. So with that in mind, okay, I have to draw your attention to what Paul's saying here in the text so I can help you to understand how this applies in 21st century Christianity. Let's insert a different work. For in Jesus Christ, neither church attendance availeth anything, nor lack of church attendance, but faith which worketh by love. How about this? For in Jesus Christ, neither passing out tracts availeth anything, nor not passing out tracts, but faith which worketh by love. How about this? For in Jesus Christ, neither tithing or giving to missions availeth anything, nor lack of giving to missions, but faith which worketh by love. You say, wait, those things do avail things. They do have some merit to them. They do have some goodness to them. Sure. Church, church attendance, you know, can indeed avail a lot of things. There are a lot of benefits to it, you know, but the key is this. It, a, ten, a church attendance avails nothing as far as your righteousness with God is concerned. Reading your Bible is great. I highly recommend it. I think you should do it every single day, twice a day. Once in the morning when you wake up, once in, before you go to bed at night. I think that's great, okay? Absolutely. And if you can read 10 pages a day, that's great. Bible reading avails you a lot of things. But as far as your merit with God is concerned, Bible reading avails nothing. You are not more justified with God on the days that you read your Bible and less justified with God on the days that you don't read your Bible. Do you understand? All right? You are not, you know, think about this. Think about the church, let's do the Bible reading. You as a person who reads your Bible every day, okay? do not have more merit with God than the Christian who reads their Bible once a week. You don't. You don't have more righteousness or merit with God than that. You are not better than that other Christian. God does not see you as more righteous than that other Christian. God doesn't love you more than that other Christian. Because your righteousness is based on the merit of Jesus Christ alone. It's that simple, okay? You know, church attendance, we could say, it does a lot of things for you, but it doesn't make you more righteous with, with God. Multivitamins. You know, multivitamins, they do a lot of good things for you, right? But they're not required. They don't make you any more righteous with God. You know, Bible reading, passing out tracts, prayer, uh, church attendance, all these things are like uh, a multivitamin for your mind or your heart, you know, your spirit. They do good things in your life, but it adds nothing to your soul. That's the key. It adds nothing to your soul. Your soul was made spotless by the blood of Christ. And nothing that you can do can make your soul more righteous or more white. It's impossible. Even if you have a white crayon and you start drawing on a super white board, it, it's, not, it's going to be dirty. <laughs> You're just going to make it white, uh, worse. If you got something that's perfectly white, there's nothing that you can add to that to make it more white. It's impossible. You, it, the, and, and as soon as you start thinking along the lines of more spiritual, more righteous, you've quenched the Holy Spirit and Christ is going to profit you nothing as long as you're thinking that way. If you as a Christian spin the wheel of righteousness thinking that, uh, you know, you can do something, uh, something for, something you can do for God will make you more righteous. You know, you spin the wheel of righteousness and you're going to see which, which work I can do, you know, to make me more righteous with God today. You're going to land on bankrupt every single time. <laughs> That's how that works. Verse 5, we're almost done. It says, for we, things about due to righteousness is the resurrection. When he says, we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness, he's referring to the resurrection. That is the hope of righteousness. Christ lived a completely righteous life, and therefore the Scripture says that while his body was in the grave, his flesh rested in hope. It says there in Romans chapter 1. His flesh rested in the hope of the resurrection. Okay? We have a bodily resurrection coming someday, and we can confidently expect to be raised from the dead based on the fact that we have Christ's righteousness. That's why we can look forward to the return of Christ and the rapture. You know, if Christ returns, I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to go up or not. Why? Not because I've been living a good life lately, 
I'm going to go up, period, because Jesus Christ, I have his righteousness imputed to me. That's why I go, okay? The reason why you're going up at the rapture, if you're saved, is because God sees you as 100% righteous. And therefore, you can wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. All right? Remember how I said it was all or nothing, okay? Now... We get it. Now, listen, the New Testament talks about another kind of resurrection. Keep that in mind. We always think of the rapture and the, you know, the, the dead in Christ shall rise, then we which are alive and remain. That's, a, that's great. That's wonderful to look forward to. But the Bible in the New Testament talks about a daily resurrection. Do you know anything about that? You can experience a daily resurrection every single day because <laughs> it's daily. All right. Um, there is a bodily resurrection that will take some time in the f take place in the future, but there's a daily resurrection too. And we get, on, we get in on that resurrection the exact same way that we get in on our bodily resurrection. It has nothing to do with your performance. It has to do with Christ's righteousness. For we, through the Spirit, not through your works, we, through the Spirit... Wait for the hope of righteousness, the resurrection, the power of the resurrection by what? Faith, 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 grace, faith, grace, faith, grace, faith. That is the key to walking in the spirit as a Christian. Not faith church attendance and faith passing out tracts and faith reading my Bible and faith doing this. Not faith works, faith works, faith works. That's what that is. You say, but those are good things. Yes, I know. Those are Bible-believing, Baptist good works. Do not get your focus on those works. Whether you do those things or don't do those things makes no difference with your merit with God. You have to understand that. Because as soon as you start thinking, well, I pass out three tracks a day. And I have extra pages in my Bible with blank where I can write extra notes. And so that makes me more spiritual than you. Or I have a King James Bible and you have an NIV. I'm more spiritual than... No, you're getting in the mindset of works and what have you done? Christ is now profiting you nothing because you're adding some leaven to that. You're no better than the guy that has the ESV or the New Living Translation or doesn't read his Bible at all. If he's born again and trusting Christ as a Savior, you are just as righteous as he is in God's sight. You've got to get that. You've got to get that. All right. As long as you live with the mentality of I have to perform, Christ will profit you nothing. And you'll be living through the power of the flesh. Oh, it'll be spiritual flesh. It'll look so nice and have a suit and a King James Bible. Christ will profit you nothing. That's why you have so many Pharisees out there these days. Because they think, what did the Pharisees think? They rejected Christ for what? Their own good works. They thought they had, they had to perform, and they thought they were better than everybody else. And consequently, they crucified Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't profit them anything. They got rid of him. you got to watch that. All right, now listen, you don't believe in a performance-based salvation. So why would you believe in a performance-based Christian life? Now, we can earn rewards, yes, by doing good things, but not righteousness. One Christian can have more rewards than another Christian. The Christian who does things for God will have more rewards than the Christian that does nothing for God. There's, that's not the equality there. Some people are going to get gold, silver, and precious stones at the judgment seat of Christ, and some are going to have their works burnt up like the wood, hay, and stubble, right? So one Christian can have more rewards than another Christian, but one Christian will not have more righteousness than another Christian, no matter what he does or doesn't do, okay? And when it comes to the rewards, you know, Paul said, I judge nothing before the time. And he said, when it comes in the context of rewards, he says, I don't know anything by myself. You know, I judge, he that judges me with is the Lord. So I'm not trying to compare myself to you and say, well, I've got more rewards than you do. Paul said, the Lord's going to bring the hidden things to light. And some of the people that look like they have a lot of rewards aren't going to have as much rewards as the person you thought wasn't doing anything. But in reality, when you weren't looking... They were passing out tracts. They were praying for people. They were trying to please God every day of their life. See? Paul had Kenny Rogers' attitude. You never count your money when you're sitting at the table. <laughs> There'll be a time enough for counting when the dealing's done. You don't count your rewards right now. Because you can lose some rewards. 
That's what Paul, John said in 1 John. So Paul pressed toward the prize, and you should too. But when it comes to clean living, when it comes to service for Jesus Christ, do not confuse earning rewards with meriting more righteousness. What you need to do is you need to get your heart and mind fixed on grace and faith. And don't worry, the good deeds will follow naturally. Like fruit from a tree. Like water from a fountain. It just, it's just natural. You don't have to try. The Bible says faith worketh. Faith does the work. How? By love. Charity extends herself for God and man naturally. Charity does what it does because it is what it is. That's really profound if you stop and think about it. <laughs> Charity does what it does because it is what it is. Charity is love in action. Don't try to mimic charity. You can't. Don't try to mimic Christ's righteousness. You can't. Just get your heart and mind fixed on grace and faith. Not your KJV Bible-believing independent Baptist works. Get your mind off of that stuff. Get the faith and grace part down first, and Christ will profit you everything. Jesus Christ will be made unto you wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, Everything that you need in your Christian life, Jesus Christ will provide for you when you're walking in the Spirit by grace, God's grace, by faith. And the love of the Spirit, that fruit of the Spirit, will come naturally. It'll flow like a fountain, like, John, like Jesus said in John 4. So stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of even independent Bible-believing Baptist bondage. Do not do it. Trusting in your good works, Mr. Born Again Christian, will short-circuit the Holy Spirit in your life. And when that happens, Christ shall profit you nothing. Because it's your flesh that you're relying on. And your righteousness. Repent of your reliance on your good works, even as a born again Christian. And get back to grace and faith and keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I come before you this morning, and I thank you, God, for this day. Thank you that we didn't have any uh, distractions with the protesters this week and uh, today, and thank you for that. And Lord, I, I do pray that you take this uh, preaching and drill it down into the hearts and minds of your people. God, it seems so simple. God, and I know how this goes. I know that people hear this and they say, oh, well, you're just saying that I can go out and kill somebody. You know, that's how unsaved people think. God, they, they miss the simplicity of the gospel because they have it in their minds that they still have to do something. And God, I know that's how it is for Christians too. They get it in their minds that they have to do all these good things in order to be right with you. But God, our righteousness is based on Jesus Christ. And Father, those good things help us to discern the difference between rewards and righteousness. And I pray, Father, that uh, if, if any of your people here or tuning in online or wherever this thing goes, if they've been trusting in their good works to somehow gain them merit with you, help them to repent of that. Because that's a lie that's been, that's a false teaching that's been given to them by the devil. And it's going to short circuit the power of God in their life. And Christ will profit them nothing so long as they think that way. And Father, I just pray that uh, you'd take these words, help your people to understand it. I know it's so simple, it sometimes goes over people's heads. But I pray, Father, that this would be understood and would be a help to your people today. And I just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed.